The theme of our messages this week is do the math. Be a calculating Christian. Understand all the different variables and do good math. Yesterday we looked at Matthew 13:44. The Lord Jesus said again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof, for happiness, goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he hath found the pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Yesterday we made the point that once you see the treasure, the rest is almost automatic. Everything else in life will seem worthless in comparison once you see the treasure and with intense happiness you'll do whatever it takes to get it today i want to lift up to you hold up to you that pearl of infinite value today we will magnify the lord jesus christ we all believe in the doctrine of the trinity one god one nature not three natures one nature in three persons, God the Father, God the Word, or God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. When God, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, when God wants to communicate, the Bible says He does so through the second person of the Trinity, God the Word. That's why He's called the Word, God the Son. And that communication didn't begin in Bethlehem. Back in Genesis chapter 1, when the Word of God says, And God said, Let there be light. That was the pre-incarnate Christ speaking light into existence with the power of His Word on behalf of the Trinity. The New Testament bears this out. Uh, Colossians, by Him all things were created, visible and invisible. John said in that famous passage that we love, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that has been made. God the Son simply spoke the world's, entire worlds into existence, and that is power. You know how powerful the Son is? If you took a little pinhead, a little grains, a grain of sand's worth uh, from the core of the Son, it would burn you to death at a thousand miles away. That's power. And the sun is millions, a million times larger than the earth. And how many suns are there in the universe? They say that there are more stars in the universe than grains of sand on all the beaches of the world. The next time you go out to the beach, you take a handful of that fine sand and let it sift through your fingers and think each one of those. Each one of those is a sun. And then a star, then look, look down at miles of beach and think about the thousands of beaches and the depth of the sand and think, my Jesus created all that with a word. Is the Lord precious to you yet as the Creator? Think about all that the pre-incarnate Christ spoke into existence out of His love for you and for me. So many wonderful gifts of love. Or do you take them for granted and complain about what you don't have or even complain about what you do have? I mean, I tell you, I'm tempted, sorely tempted to complain about your water down here. But you know what? It's sheer grace. It's sheer grace that I, who deserve nothing but hell, where people beg for a drop of water, that I would have any water at all. How wicked it is to breathe Christ's air, drink Christ's water, eat Christ's fruits and vegetables and meats and grains. And hardly thank Him for it, except that little cursory prayer at the beginning of the meal. I think sometimes God would rather have us not even do that prayer. He'd rather have us thank God with every bite. Oh God, how, do I, how, how can I thank You for this? 
I, I was a college student. I know that one of the pastimes of college students is complaining. And some of you speak more words of complaint in a day than words of praise. And that's a, I tell you, it's a wicked thing to walk across this beautiful world and this beautiful campus and, and not just praise God, not just be in a daze that God would be so kind to give all these things to us. The pre-incarnate Christ created watermelons and apples and wheat to make pancakes and waffles <laughs> and cotton for your clothes and animals to get leather for your shoes. He's so kind to you, so loving. May God open your eyes and my eyes to the treasure that is Christ the Creator. But that's not all that the pre-incarnate Christ did. The sixth day, He took the elements of the ground and formed them into a body. And then He breathed into that body the breath of life. And when that happened, it was the pre-incarnate Christ who stooped to do it. And it wasn't the last time that He stooped. And then, oh, I love this, when He saw how much Adam needed a wife, needed a helper, it was the pre-incarnate Christ who did the surgery and, and tweaked the chromosomes and cloned the queen for Adam. Praise God. He did it. What a gift that was. And it was the pre-incarnate Christ who planted a garden, gave him everything they needed, and he said, you can have everything here. It's all yours. Except the one fruit, the testing fruit. And even that was good. Because it was probably the God-ordained way that they would, in, in, in that little tiny bit of obedience there, they would advance in their, in their knowledge of God, their love of God, and attain to glories and graces that they could only imagine at the beginning. It was the pre-incarnate Christ who, who warned them about rebellion against God and the consequences, that is, separation from God, death. He warned them. He's a warning and loving Christ, and when they committed treason, when they committed treason and joined Satan's side and went from being the royal family to the ruined family, slaves of demons, and ruined not just themselves, but the whole human race as well, guess who it was who came in the cool of the day to seek and to save that which was lost and said, Adam, where are you? It was the pre-incarnate Christ. It was He who pronounced God's curse on Adam and Eve and Satan and the world. And this is the interesting thing. It was the pre-incarnate Christ who gave that amazing promise in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, which is what the whole Bible is all about. He, the seed of the woman, shall crush your head, Satan. He could have said, I'm going to crush your head, Satan. And you will bruise my heel. And it was the pre-incarnate Christ so busy in the Old Testament, warning, warning Cain, warning Noah about the flood. It was the pre-incarnate Christ who passed between the parts of the animal that Abraham had prepared in that ceremony of covenant, serious ceremony, solemn ceremony of covenant. And it was... And it was a pre-incarnate Christ who walked between the parts that were laid on either side there, signifying that He was guaranteeing, He was guaranteeing that He Himself would someday come as the promised seed through whom all the nations of the earth, that's us, would be blessed. And then He later reaffirmed and confirmed that same covenant with Isaac and Jacob, Moses, David, it was the pre-incarnate Christ who appeared in a burning bush to Moses. He was the one who was the, the, the cloud by day, the fire by night. He descended onto Sinai in earthquake and fire and smoke so that the, the Israelites didn't even want to look at it. The pre-incarnate Christ etched the Ten Commandments into stone. And it was He by the Holy Spirit who led Moses and David and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all the other prophets to pen the Old Testament that we treasure so much. It was the Spirit of Jesus who was leading them to write all those things, the New Testament says. 
And I want to ask you, is the Lord Jesus precious to you as the pre-incarnate Christ? Busy in the Old Testament period, preparing everything for His coming. And then the day came. The day came when the pre-incarnate Christ said to the Father, Here I am. Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God, a body you have prepared for me. Those were his words. And in an instant, the God who had formed the first body became embodied, incarnate. The pre-incarnate Christ became the incarnate Christ. Paul tells us about this perhaps hardest to understand of all mysteries in the book of Philippians. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God uh, as robbery. He didn't regard it as something to be grasped. He emptied himself. He made himself nothing. He took upon himself the form of a servant. And being found in the likeness of men, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And I want to ask this question. What was Christ's motivation to do that? Why did he do it besides sheer obedience? And that's a, that's a blessed thing. That's a precious thing. That the Son would obey the Father for our sakes and for the glory of God. Oh, the active obedience of Christ during his life. It's a precious thing. He obeyed in every point like I didn't obey. And you didn't obey. And then he obeyed all the way to death on the cross. And what motivated him? Is there any clue in the Bible as to what motivated him? And if you'll turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews 12, 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. The author and perfecter of faith. Who, here it is, for the joy, for the joy, the happiness, the eternal pleasures set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. This verse says that Christ was motivated, among other things, to go to the cross by the eternal happiness that was set before him as a reward. You say he had plenty of joy and happiness before he came. Yes. But he didn't have you. He didn't have you. Now think about it. He didn't have you. You, the chosen, the, de the, delight, the delighted of God, the delightful of God, the loved of God, chosen before the foundation of the world. And unless Christ came, God couldn't have a single person in heaven that he had forechosen and foreloved before the foundation of the world. Not one. Why did God even choose to love us before the foundation of the world? Well, that's mystery, except the answer for His glory. But you know what? Once He decided to love you, He had to save you. You see, if you can, if you can, you always save the people you love. If you can. And God can. But oh, at what great cost. For the joy of obeying God the Father, the joy of defeating sin and Satan and crushing His head, the joy of reconciling all the broken things to, to, to God, making things right, and the joy of having you forever with Him in heaven. For that joy, Christ endured the cross, despising the shame. And I'm not being flippant when I say Christ did the math. Christ did the math. He calculated. He, he saw all the variables. And He said, yes, I have come to do Your will, O God. And it was very hard math. Let's look at Christ in the garden. You might want to turn to Mark 14, 32. Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, I, think, I don't think there's another passage that gives us a glimpse into how difficult this was than 
Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, Mark 14, 32, they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore, amazed, and to be very heavy. Now, these words don't resonate with us. They're words that were good for a few hundred years ago, but we'll talk about what these words mean in a few minutes. And he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground. He fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will but what thou wilt. Listen, the Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when you read it, they strain the limits of their Greek vocabulary to describe what was going on here in the garden. The anguish. Words like uh, distressed, troubled, deeply grieved. And, and, and this is the part that, that gets me. His, he fell on his face. He fell to the ground. You remember when you were a kid and you'd read the Bible storybooks and you saw the picture of Jesus calmly kneeling and, and with his hands like this on that big white rock. You know what I'm talking about? And the beautiful shaft of moonlight uh, bathing the scene of serenity. Forget it. It wasn't anything like that. It wasn't anything like that. The Lord Jesus, who knew why He had come when the hour finally came, He was filled with unimaginable dread. Now, you've heard preachers say, that this scene reveals what about Christ? The humanity of Christ. But I disagree. You know, mere men, mere men have faced worse torture, if that's possible, and I think it is, worse physical torture, and faced death with more calmness than this. No falling on their faces, begging God to take away the cup. And I, I gotta tell you, if this is the human nature of Christ recoiling from the physical sufferings of the cross, then I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. And that's why some people come up with the idea that he was praying about not the cross, but Lord, may the cup of dying right here in the garden be taken away from me and all. But you know, we don't have to come up with ideas like that because, in fact, rather than revealing the humanity of Christ, Gethsemane reveals the deity of Christ. The God nature of Christ. You see, never in all of His eternal existence had the Word of God, the righteous and holy Word of God, ever been stained with a single sin. Yet in a few hours, He was going to become the sins of billions. And think of those sins. Think of them in all their vileness and grossness and wretchedness. And how many of them, countless and yet for Christ, you think about it, it wasn't countless for Christ. Remember, Christ had two natures, human and divine. And the divine nature was still omniscient. It wasn't countless for Christ. Christ knew exactly how many sins would be imputed to Him. And here's the gross part. He knew exactly what each one of those sins were. Your sins. My sins. And his holy soul recoiled in horror at receiving the guilt of those sins into his pure heart. I mean, imagine, think about you. You and I are used to being ashamed and guilty and, and being blamed for stuff. Imagine if you were blamed for some unspeakable crime. Think of the grossest crime you can think of. And you were blamed for it. It was a mistake. You're innocent. But they come to your house and they handcuff you. And then the, and the cameras are rolling. You're on the evening news that night. What shame. I mean, you're innocent. You're, you know you're going to be exonerated. But like, like in a bad dream, you, at the, the day of the trial, the last day of the trial, you hear the words, guilty is charged, and you hear the sound of the gavel, and you're taken away to, to bear the punishment of somebody else. Now, if you, who are familiar with sin, recoil at that thought, 
Imagine the sinless, stainless, pure Son of God who knew no sin as He faced taking the sins of billions. No wonder He said, Father, if there's any way, take this cup from Him. No wonder He said that. But then the, the next word, the word that I just, I read and I just praise God. He says, nevertheless. Nevertheless. The whole drama turns on that word. Nevertheless. Not my will, but yours be done. And as I said before, besides sheer obedience, besides sheer obedience, what made him say, nevertheless, and it was the joy, the eternal happiness that was set before him, and that includes his love for you. That includes the joy of having you, the one that he loved before all eternity, before the foundation of the world, forever with Him in heaven. That's precious. You know, Christ didn't just come to save an undifferentiated mass of humanity. He came to save individuals, faces, names, you. For the joy of having you, dear Christian, He endured the cross. Is He precious to you yet? Are you seeing the treasure that is Christ? And I haven't even described the physical horrors of the cross. I don't even think I have time to do that. But just think about the physical horrors, the shame, the pure agony of it. It was so shameful that it was illegal to use it against a Roman citizen. It was awful. Worst form of execution ever devised. Christ was half dead from the flogging. They make him carry the heavy cross piece through town. They throw him down on the cross, his raw back against the, against the rough wood. Soldiers pound filthy nails into his, into his uh, hand, into the, the most sensitive nerve of the body. Ever have carpal tunnel syndrome, anybody here? The debilitating pain, the searing pain of that. Imagine having a nail driven into that, right into that nerve. And then your body hanging from that nerve. And then the choice, as you're hanging there, as you're hanging there, suffocating, the choice is either suffocate or pull yourself up on those nails and take a breath. And then a few seconds later, you've got to make the choice again. Seconds drag on. Minutes, hours. It was terrible. who for the joy set before Him endured the cross. And as I said, that was not the worst of it. The spiritual agony was infinitely worse. And I mean infinitely. I mean, there's so much, only so much a human can do to your body. There's only so much they can do to Christ's body. There's a limit to that. That's why Jesus said, don't fear people who can kill your body, but can't do anything with your soul. Fear the one who can, who can throw both body and soul into hell. That's the one you ought to fear. That infinite Punishment is what you ought to fear, and that's what Christ took upon Himself on the cross. And how did He do it? I have no idea. I just pray that someday in heaven, God would give us the capacity to understand the infinite price that Christ paid for us on the cross. And we will worship Him for all eternity for it. It was that infinite spiritual agony that caused Him to cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is the, this, the clear message of the Bible is that God had no reason to forsake His Son unless the Son became sin for us. And this was the cup that He prayed, He begged God to take away, if possible. Listen to these scriptures. Isaiah 53, He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. Surely He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered Him stricken by God, smitten by Him and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon Him. And by His wounds we are healed. We, like sheep, have gone astray. We're the ones who've, who've gone our own way. The Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Lord Jesus said, this is the reason the Son of Man came. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. 
and to give his life as a ransom for many, for the joy set before him. It wasn't with perishable things that we were redeemed from that empty way of life received from our forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. Is the Lord Jesus Christ precious to you as your rescuer? Have you seen the treasure yet? And then comes my favorite part. Because the verse in Hebrews doesn't end with despising the shame. If you're still open there, you can look at it. It continues like this. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Death dies and Christ lives. The Lord Jesus explodes from the tomb with life and power and authority. And then 40 days later, He ascends up to heaven and He's sitting at the right hand of the throne of God where He is in charge of absolutely everything. I mean, not a single hair of your head which He can count. He knows how many there are. Not a single hair of your head can be hurt or touched unless He allows that to happen. You are immortal until the day God says it's time for you to go to heaven. He has tied up the strong man. And all that's left is for you and me to go all over the world and plunder Satan's house. That's all that's left. Just mop up after what Christ has done. The Lord Jesus Christ is reigning right now. He sends the Katrinas and the and the Francis and the Jeans and the Ritas and maybe the Wilmas. He does whatever He pleases in the universe. And that's why they sing to Christ in Revelation. We're going to end with these great verses. Revelation 5, 9. They sang a new song. Let's bow in prayer as we think about this. They sang a new song. They sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, O Lord. Because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. That's me. That's you. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto Him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. O God, open our eyes to our inheritance. Help us to see the preciousness of You. Help us to see that You are our very great reward, our portion. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of Your glory and grace. We worship You in Jesus' name. Amen.